probably the, the most significant psilocybin active mushroom of, the, uh, of this century is Philosophy cubensis. Uh, this photograph was taken uh, outside of Palenque uh, in Mexico. And this single mushroom, as most all of us are aware of, can easily be cultivated and is extremely popular. Um, the cool thing about this this whole field is that we can collect spore prints, we can put them on, on paper, we can put them into envelopes, and then we can mail them all over the world. Uh, and it's a very convenient and easy way to, to spread spore mass and progeny. All of you here, whether you know it or not, are psilocybin mushroom cultivators by the mere fact that you're in this room with each other. We are all spreading spore mass on our clothes, on our hats, you know, on, et cetera. And by going back to our respective homes, the mushrooms are using us as vehicles for spreading their spores. And I don't think this is necessarily happenstance. I think there's a grand design in this whole scheme, as I'll show. <laughs> and a very fun thing to do, and I hope many of you come to Palenque. We kind of started this, this, this tradition two years ago is there's lots of lots of cubensis, uh, uh growing in the fields there. And so before everybody departs, we encourage them to take spore prints on their hats, spore prints on their clothing. And then you get, then when you go through customs and you get onto airplanes, you know, even even though you may be beside extremely conservative neo-fascist Christian types, you can enlist their support for spreading spores in you know, around the world. So um, how I fell into this, now it's a very peculiar coincidence. Uh, I met Jonathan Ott just as he was leaving the Evergreen State College. I like to call the Evergreen State College the, the psilocybin State College. Uh, in 1975, 1976, um, I, I went there, and Jonathan was just going uh, on to study with Dr. Gaston Guzman in Mexico. By coincidence, we ended up in the same laboratory complex uh, with basically some of the same people. Uh, and at that... At, from Jonathan's initial interest in psilocybin mushrooms, uh, Dr. Michael Bug uh, got a DEA license, a Drug, Enforcement, a Drug Enforcement Administration license, which then covered my work and that of Jeremy Bigwoods. And then between the four of us, we wanted to publish maybe a dozen papers on the pharmacology or taxonomy of psilocybin active mushrooms. Um, so my, my specialty was scanning electron microscopy. I was a lab rat. I, I spent hundreds, thousands of hours in front of the scanning electron microscope, primarily looking at psilocybin mushrooms. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm going to show you some of those micrographs, uh, which were then included in Dr. Gaston Guzman's monograph and, and used to delineate different species uh, in the genus Psilocybe. So this is a spore of Psilocybe baocystis. Uh, most of the spores uh, in the genus Psilocybe tend to be ellipsoid and smooth, and they uh, typically have a germ pore right here and this is the site of where it all begins this is this is where ger uh, spore germination starts um, and then coincident with the germination of spores is the uh, competition with bacteria and it's from that dualistic uh, situation between bacteria and fungi that we've gained most of our notable antibiotics and so I, I want to try to impress upon you that psilocybin mushrooms are not just magic in the sense that they can have these effects, uh, but I think they are instrumental in, um, in, in creating an ecology of consciousness. And um, I believe that in the 1960s and 1970s and going on to today, the ecology movement is largely driven by a keen sense and a, a keen benefit of knowledge gained through, through psilocybin mushrooms. And I think many he people here share, share in that, is that when you eat large doses of these mushrooms, you're impressed by many different things, but there's a kind of a call to arms. A, a, there's a calling out from nature that the earth is in trouble, that these, these are the guardians of the planet, and it's our turn you know, to accept this responsibility and to try to repair the harm and to preserve the ecosystems of of this planet before it's too late. So I, I don't think it's, it, it is a hedonistic, uh, egocentric experience. I think it's a global experience, and I don't think it's just by coincidence. I think there is, a, there is an ultimate design behind all of this. So spores germinate, and here we have one spore of Psilocybe uh, polliculosa that is germinating. 
And um, then very quickly, as one spore germinates, uh, adjacent spores are stimulated into germination. So there is a kind of a domino effect where there's an increasing number of spores that are germinating as time goes on. And then very quickly, a mycelial network is created, a web. Uh, and this, this mycelial network you can see here, and there are spores underneath. In fact, this is a spore print that I added water to, and the spores germinated. And then the, this overlaying mycelial network covered the spore print. Now, very quickly, this mycelial network extends, and it's exquisitely well-designed. It's a mosaic of cells, and I believe it is, it is Earth's natural Internet. It is, it is, it, they, there are mosaics of interfacing mycelial networks uh, uh, upon one another uh, over every landmass on this planet. If you were to take a cubic inch of uh, soil or sawdust that is well permeated with mushroom mycelium and you were to stretch the cells end on end, there can be more than a mile or, uh, or two-thirds of a kilometer of hyphal cells stretched end upon end. So in this much soil, there can be almost, uh, almost a kilometer of mushroom mycelium stretched end on end. There is no site-specific orifice for the digestion of nutrients. The entire surface area is a membrane for the, rele for the release of, uh, of enzymes and acids which break down plant material. It is the entire foundation of our ecosystem. Without fungi, the, all the plants w would quickly die because there would, there would be a lack of nutrients. It's the recycling of dead plant material and other, or and other organic complexes back into the ecosystem that is made possible by the mushroom mycelium. I believe this mycelial network is a neural net network for the Gaian consciousness. I believe we all are partaking and taking steps through different doors coming to the same, re same realization that we aren't separate from this planet. We are, we are of this planet. We are a community. You know, our minds may think that we are humans and those are animals and those are plants, but I think many of us have come to realize that we're all part of a one. And the mushroom mycelium is the natural neural net that is sentient. And I, I do not exaggerate. I believe that mushroom mycelium has a consciousness. It is sentient. When something happens in the ecosystem, especially a, a catastrophe, it is the mycelial networks that sense this and then design responses for quickly capturing nutrients that are locked up in dead organic plant material, wood, etc., and then colonize it and then recycle it back into the ecosphere. And I think that all of us, you know, whether we are willing uh, or knowing or unknowing participants in this process, I think as time goes on, the importance of our being aware of these processes becomes paramount. So here's an example of uh, Psilocybe azurescens, which is one of my favorite species right now, that is tenaciously holding together wood chips uh, of alder. And this is what I seek as a cultivator to do, is to create a mycelial tenacity, uh, a mycelial platform that is dense enough that you can then, you, this platform can, can explode into mushrooms or be used as spawn. And uh, I have a, another book that I'm working on that should be out in the next year, which is a totally non-technical book about how, how to use transplant, transplantation techniques for moving mushroom mycelium from one place to another. And you can create a perennial 